Hey, what's up guys? My name is Echerno. Welcome back to my OpenGL series. So today we're going to be talking all about shaders, finally, and we're finally going to be able to actually see something on the screen. So last time we talked about vertex attributes, and before that we talked about vertex objects and vertex buffers and all that stuff. So definitely check out those videos if you haven't by just clicking on the link up there. And from last episode, some of you were actually able to already see something on the screen. And if we dive into the code that we wrote last time over here, we basically just wrote these two lines. If I try and run this application as is with any, any kind of shader stuff at all, then you'll see on my computer, it actually works. And we do seem to see a triangle, a white triangle at our correct vertex positions, which we actually specified over here. So how come that's happening? And the answer to that is that some GPU drivers will actually provide you with a default shader if you haven't if you haven't actually provided your own shader. And that was that's what seems to be happening here. But this is something that is really, really based on your drivers. Right now, I'm just running this with the Intel drivers on this actual laptop. However, I do also have an NVIDIA GPU, which we'll probably have to switch to later for more serious things. But that being said, it's completely driver dependent, so I don't really want to kind of, that. that's why I didn't run it last time and I don't really want to encourage that because it'll probably end up working for some of you, but not for all of you. And then some of you will be like, my code doesn't work. It's not really meant to. There's nothing in the OpenGL standard that actually says, you should see a triangle if you write the code that we've done right now. That's actually just up to the GPU manufacturers to say, hey, you know what? If you don't provide a shader, we'll just write a basic one for you so that you can at least debug your code a bit easier or something like that. Today, we're actually going to write our own shaders. So the first question on everyone's mind is what is a shader? A shader is basically just a program that runs on your GPU. That's all you, that's all you should be thinking of when you think about a shader. By program, I just mean a like a block of code. It's code that we can write as text, as a string on our actual computer. Then we can give it to OpenGL, we can send it to the graphics card, compile it like any other program, link it like any other program, and then run it like any other program. But the difference is that it actually is run on our GPU, on our graphics card, and not on our CPU like this C++ program is. So why do we need programs to actually run on the GPU at all? Why, why do we have to write code and then run it on the GPU. Well, obviously we're learning about graphics programming. So the graphics card does play a major role in that. But specifically the reason that we want to be able to program the GPU is because, well, we want to be able to tell the GPU what to do. We want to utilize the power of the GPU to actually draw graphics on the screen. Now that doesn't mean that everything we do, we need to do on the GPU or we should be doing on the GPU in the form of a shader. There are some things that the CPU is still faster at and as we kind of progress through this series, we'll probably find some things that we will prefer to do on the CPU and then maybe just send the result, the resulting data to the GPU while still doing that processing on the CPU. But that being said, there are undeniably things, a lot of things to do with graphics that the GPU is simply going to be way faster at. And that's where shaders come in handy. Now, not just when we want to defer things, now, not just when we want to kind of take things from the CPU and put them on the GPU, but fundamentally we need to be able to program the GPU because even in the form of drawing of drawing this really simple triangle, I still want to be able to tell the GPU how to draw that triangle, right? Like where do the vertex positions go? What color should the triangle be? How should it be drawn? All that kind of stuff, right? When we actually get into more complex 3D scenes as well, lighting is a great example of why we want to be able to program the GPU. How does lighting work? All of that stuff, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but all of that stuff needs to be programmed somehow. The GPU doesn't just know how to do this, right? We need to tell the GPU what to do with the data that we've sent it. And that is what a shader fundamentally is. Now in this episode and for most of OpenGL and for most of graphics programming, where, and you as well, are probably gonna be focused on two types of shaders, vertex shaders and fragment shaders. Fragment shaders are also known as pixel shaders, by the way. So these two shader types are by far the two kind of most popular ones and probably the ones that you will be using 90% of the time. There are other shader types, tessellation shaders, geometry shaders, that kind of stuff, compute shaders if you're doing like completely kind of other stuff as well. There are many different types of shaders. Don't think that there are just vertex and fragment shaders. That's it, you're done, that's all, that's all there is. There, there's much more. And they do come in handy when you kind of start getting to the more advanced stuff. And we will certainly be covering those types of shaders further down in this series when we get to more complex graphics. But for now, and for like 90% of shader programming, you're probably going to be dealing with vertex and fragment or pixel shaders, right? 
that's it. So first of all, let's talk about what that actually means. What is a vertex shader? What is a fragment shader? What are they? Why are there two types? How do we use them? So I know I haven't really covered the OpenGL pipeline or the just the standard kind of graphics rendering pipeline yet, but how this roughly works, or really the picture that you should be having in your head is that we've written a bunch of data on the CPU. We've sent some data to the GPU. We've issued something called a draw call. We've bound certain states as well before issuing that draw call. And finally, we kind of get to the shader stage of things, or rather the GPU gets to actually processing the draw call and drawing something on the screen and we get to see a triangle on the screen. That specific process is basically the rendering pipeline, right? How do we go from having data to actually having a result on our screen? Now shaders come in handy when the GPU actually starts drawing its triangle. And vertex and fragment shaders are two different shader types that are along that pipeline. So when we actually issue a draw call, what happens is the vertex shader will get called, and then the fragment shader will get called, and then we'll see a result on the screen. Now there are many things in between that I have skipped over for simplicity's sake. There are many stages before the vertex shader, many stages in between the vertex and fragment shader, as well as between the fragment shader and the rasterization stage and all of that stuff. I don't want to really cover that right now. I'm trying to keep this simple. So just keep that in mind, all of you advanced people who know exactly what's going on, but are still watching these videos for some reason. I'm kidding, by the way, pretty much everyone should watch these videos because it might fill in a lot of gaps that you're missing. But anyway, the point being, I am, I am simplifying this. So we go from the draw call to the vertex shader, to the fragment shader, to being able to see pixels on our screen. Now what the vertex shader does, or specifically the code that is our vertex shader, that gets, that gets called for each vertex that we're trying to render. So in this case, we have a triangle. We have three vertices, okay? That means that the vertex shader will get called three times. Okay, one for each vertex. And the primary purpose of a vertex shader is to tell OpenGL where you want that vertex to be in your screen space, right? So where is, so again, simplifying this, where in your window, you have a, you have a window open on your computer where you're rendering these graphics, where would you like that, those, that vertex to be, right? That is what the primary purpose of a vertex shader is. Just again, it has the word shader in it. So some people like to think of it like to have, as having something to do with lighting or shadows or no, it's a program. That's all it is. So this doesn't even have anything to do with actual graphics, traditional graphics in terms of like color or whatever. All the vertex shader does is it specifies where you want the positions to be. Now, that being said, it's also used to pass data kind of from attributes into the next stage. And then also, well, in, in our case, the next stage is the fragment shader. So it's also used for that because of course the vertex shader will actually take in all of the vertex attributes that we've specified in our buffer. In this case, we only have a position. These positions that we've specified, if we look back to our code, these kind of negative 0.5 and all of, the, all of this actual, this stuff, we can access this in our actual vertex shader because we've actually specified them as vertex attribute pointers. And you would have noted that we also wrote the index zero. And this index zero is actually going to correspond to an index zero, which we'll define in our actual vertex shader. And through that kind of format, we'll be able to actually access the data or access this specific vertex attribute data, this specific vert vertex attribute being the position. So once we've accessed that position in our vertex shader, we can basically tell OpenGL, I want you to position this vertex at the position that we specified in the attribute. Now, you might be thinking this is a very, very trivial task. Like, why does this even need to exist? Obviously, we want to position our triangle or, or our vertex position where we've actually specified in our buffer. Well, yes, but think about this. What if you have a camera? You have a camera in a 3D world and its, it's position is somewhere. Suddenly, this, these, vertex position with, these vertex positions that we've specified for our triangle aren't really going to translate directly to being on the screen at those same positions, because if the camera's moved, then, well, the triangle should move as well. And that kind of transformation of that triangle needs to happen somewhere. Now, this comes down to certain things being faster to do on the CPU and the GPU, and there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of thought that goes into this, and we'll certainly cover it when we get up to writing cameras and stuff like that. But all I'm saying is that don't think of it, it's not actually that trivial as just saying that the data, the, da the data that is in my buffer, that is where I want my vertices to be because there are certain transformations that actually need to happen. 
based on certain states and just a lot of other stuff as well. But the, again, the primary purpose of a vertex trader is to provide those vertex positions. We need to be able to provide some kind of transformation if, if, nece if necessary so that OpenGL can actually transform these numbers into actual on-screen coordinates so that we see our graphics in our window at the right location in the right place. So once the vertex trader has run, and I remember it runs for each vertex, once that's happened, and we've run it in our case three times, it gets called three times, one for each vertex. We move on to the next stage in our pipeline, in our pipeline for this application, which is the fragment shader or the pixel shader. Now, fragment sh fragments and pixels are a little bit different kind of terminology. We're not gonna get into that now, but for now you can kind of think of pixels as, fra or rather you can think of fragments as pixels because the fragment shader is going to run once for each pixel that needs to get rasterized. What I mean by rasterized is actually drawn on our screen. So our window is just basically made up of pixels, right? It's like a pixel array. What needs to happen is those three vertices that we've kind of specified that make up our triangle now need to get filled in with actual pixels. That's what the rasterization stage is doing. And the fragment shader or the pixel shader is going to get called one once for each pixel in our triangle that needs to get filled in. And the primary purpose of our fragment shader or our pixel shader is to actually decide which color that pixel is supposed to be. That's all it does. It, it just, it determines a color, an output color for our pixel so that we can get, so that, so that the pixel can get shaded with the right color. Think of this as like a coloring book where you've kind of got an outline of things, but you need to actually color it in. You need to shade it in with a certain color. That's what the fragment shader is responsible for. Now, straight away, you might have noticed a difference between the two. Vertex shader gets called three times. Fragment shader might get called tens of thousands of times, right? Depending on how much room our actual triangle occupies on our screen. If you have a tiny triangle, a really small triangle in your window, that might only get called like, I don't know, 50 times or something, maybe if it ends up taking up 50 pixels. If you have a giant triangle just filling your window in you know, OpenGL or something like that, you might, it might be taking up like, I don't know, a million pixels or 500,000 pixels or something like that, which means that that fragment shader is actually going to get called 500,000 times immediately. And I want you guys to realize this even from the very beginning that if I do something like five times five equal, like I, I calculate what five times five is in the vertex shader and the value of that is 25, that calculation is going to happen three times in, in the process of rendering this triangle because the vertex shader gets called three times. If we have a huge triangle and we do five times five that calculation in the fragment shader and that fragment shader gets called 500,000 times, suddenly we're doing 500,000 multiplications and not three. There's a bit of a difference here, right? Which is why when it comes to, when it comes time to kind of optimize and think about performance, which is really all the time, you can probably start to notice that, hey, it might be worth me doing some of these critical operations in the vertex shader rather than the fragment shader. And again, you can pass data from the vertex shader to the fragment shader as well. So yeah, just something to think about. Just wanted to mention that, keep that in mind. Fragment shader, things in there tend to be a lot more expensive because that fragment shader is going to run for each pixel. That being said, some things obviously need to get calculated per pixel. So a great example, I love bringing up this example with Fragment Trader specifically, is lighting, right? If you're calculating lighting, each pixel is going to have a color value that is determined by a number of things. For example, the lighting, the environment potentially, the texture, the material that's applied to the surface, all of this stuff, right, comes together to determine what the correct color is for a specific pixel. Obviously this is going to depend on a number of inputs such as where the camera position is. And as I said, all the surface properties, the environment properties, all of that stuff is gonna to come together. But in the end of the day, at, at the end of the day, all you're determining in the fragment shader is the color of a single pixel. That is what the fragment shader does. It's a program that runs to determine which color this pixel should be. That's it. Once that happens, once that fragment shader gets calculated, your color will basically make it to the to the screen, okay? To the actual, to your actual window that is open on your computer. And we'll see an actual triangle, a white triangle in this case, because the, the, the default shader in this exam, in our example, in our driver seems to be just defaulting to white, which is probably a reasonable default. But anyway, when we start writing these shaders, 
it will be whatever color we specify. So as an easy test, we could just say that, hey, every single pixel for this triangle should be red, and we should just see a completely red triangle, okay? Fragment shaders run for each pixel, and they determine the color output. Vertex shaders run for each vertex, and they determine the position on our screen. That is basically how shaders work. Now, you may think that I'm really oversimplifying things because I am omitting a lot of the stages of the actual pipeline and a lot of other shaders that we actually have available to us, but I, I don't think I'm actually oversimplifying at all. That is actually as simple as it is. That being said, you can do some really cool stuff with this, right? You have something that runs for each vertex and for each pixel. With that, you can do like 90% of graphics programming. Everything you see in games nowadays is probably done 80 to 90% in those shaders. Okay, and believe me, once you get to some really nice looking graphics, those shaders could be thousands of lines of code. So they definitely get very complicated. Not to mention that a lot of the game engines and certainly every kind of serious big game engine actually generates shaders on the fly based on what's going on in your game and based on what graphics settings you've selected and all that stuff. So having like kind of live shader generation and compilation is very, very common in game engines. So there's definitely a lot of really cool things you can actually end up doing with shaders. Anyway, that's a gentle introduction to shaders. We didn't get to writing any code this time, but we definitely will next time. I just wanted to give you guys a basic overview, finally kind of a bit of a technical overview of what shaders are, how they work, what they're used for and all that, and hopefully we'll see them in practice in the next episode. One more thing I wanna mention is that like everything else in OpenGL, shaders work based on the state machine, which means that when you want to enable a shader, you're about to draw a triangle and you want it to use a certain shader to draw that triangle, you enable that shader. You might also send some data to the shader. So much like we're sending this vertex data from the CPU to the GPU in the form of a vertex buffer, we can also send data to our shader in the form of something called a uniform and that comes from the CPU as well. So we kind of set up all of that state, enable the shader, and then we draw our triangle. That's how it works in OpenGL. Again, like the rest of OpenGL, it's pretty much just a state machine. If you guys enjoyed this video, you can hit that like button. You can also help support this series by going over to patreon.com forward slash the churno. It really does help me make more of these episodes and more quickly and all that fun stuff. You also get some pretty cool rewards such as access to all of the source code for all of these videos, kind of episode by episode on GitHub and plenty of other rewards as well. Just check out that link. If you want to discuss this episode further, I've got an OpenGL channel on my Discord. You can head on over and join that Discord by going to the channel.com slash discord. It's basically just a nice community of people where you can talk about C++, OpenGL, games, all that kind of fun stuff. So definitely join via that link there. I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.